So, um, hello everyone. So, my name is Dario Di Lorenzo. I'm from the European Guild for Structural Integration. And um, I'm in, uh, currently I'm in Milan. Um, and um, let me tell you why, why, why we're organizing this. So, the European Guild for Structural Integration, we wanted the to do something in these exceptional times that um, was made to cultivate our bonds, to stay together, to, to cultivate our relationships, uh, and somehow also to nourish our hearts. Mm. So also inspired by the work that Liz Stewart is doing on, uh, on Facebook, she's reading uh, books and she's staying connecting. Uh, we, we said, why, why don't we do something that uh, uh, we, we take our uh, community together um, and, and do uh, maybe uh, a chat, uh, uh, an informal, interactive, uh, free chat uh, on structural integration. Um, and talking about uh, emotional, spiritual, historical aspects of this art, um, what could help us to stay uh, connected with our arts and with our community? So here, here we are with these chats, and this is the first one. We welcome you all. Um, and uh, the first chat will be with David Davis. Uh, David is going to introduce himself uh, soon and is in, on how I got on into SI and how SI has got into me. Um, we also have in line other four chats. The next one is next Tuesday with Bert Smith and he's going to be um, somehow, uh, Bert is gonna help us centering uh, uh, in ourselves in this troubled time. Uh, Bert is a clinical psychologist, is, a, is also a psychiatrist and it's a rover. So um, it, it is putting all together and will help us somehow or, um, getting centered in ourselves. Then we will also have, I'm gonna just tell you the names of the other that are going to be the next one. Um, we're gonna have Nilsi Silvera from Brazil, Alex Urbancic, uh, Fulvio Faudella. These are so far the, the least of the person that are, um, are going to be lined up for this chat. Remember this is, uh, an interactive um, chat, so I'm just gonna tell you some tech stuff. So you have, uh, this is not very tech, uh, I have printed this out. So you have at the bottom of the screen, you have these three buttons. One is chat, one is raise a hand, the other one is uh, um, question and answer. So ideally, you should uh, uh, chat for, uh, um, for technical stuff right now. Uh, if you want to ask question to um, David, uh, you should uh, um, raise the hand or use the question and, act, uh, and answer button, okay? Um, if uh, I enable your microphone, you will have to confirm that to unmute the mic. And that's it uh, uh, from the technical stuff. I think, let me check if I said everything. Um, okay, this is the first meeting, so be patient if we will have uh, technical issues. Um, and I think now it's uh, the time I hand over the microphone to David. Uh, David, uh, you're on. You're feel free to introduce yourself and, uh, and it's your now. Thank you, Dario. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to um, all of you. I, uh, um, I'm really um, surprised, pleased, and impressed with uh, the global um, uh, quality of all of you coming. And um, I thank you for making time and space today for this particular opportunity. And uh, I believe that each of you will get something beneficial out of this. I already have just in the, the setting up of this and my association with, with uh, Dario and Alesh and everyone else at the European Guild. So. Um, um, but to begin with, I would like to take a moment, uh, uh, or if you will, make a moment of silence for all the people who are suffering from this uh, extraordinary virus that is affecting everyone. And um, a lot of people have died, and a lot more will. So I'd like to take just a moment of silence for 
those people that actually, you know, in a sense, bring us together this morning. So if you would uh, go into your heart for a minute and uh, settle in there and just close your eyes. Thank you, everyone. That was a beautiful pregnant pause. And uh, you know, it's interesting in this time, um, all of our lives have been put on pregnant pause, if you will. We'll all, we all have to settle down. Here in Colorado, uh, we're pretty much on lockdown now. And um, uh, the city of Denver is only allowing people to uh, come and go if they do necessary things, essential services. I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself very briefly, um, uh, and that is that um, I'm in my 44th year of doing this work, and um, I uh, have been teaching now for 30 years, and um, uh, uh, I, I, I was a guy who never wanted to have a career. Um, one could uh, uh, easily say that I have had one and I have one, so um, this work has touched me in a way that nothing else could or would. I was born in Denver, Colorado in 1947, so that's, you know, post-war person. And uh, um, uh, growing up in the United States during the 1950s, we used to have air raid drills in school where we would uh, have to duck under our desks and one thing and another. We had this continual uh, oppressive uh, Cold War event that was um, looking over us, looking over our shoulders. And um, it, it's kind of like the virus, only it wasn't as oppressive in a, in a very real sense. And um, uh, um, in Denver, there were no rolfers or any, any structural integrators uh, at that time. Uh, never heard of such a thing. My parents didn't uh, do chiropractic or anything else alternative. In 1965, I took an experimental course in high school, uh, which was called psychology. And it was so... Uh, experimental that we didn't even have a, uh, a textbook. We had to um, uh, subscribe to a new magazine called Psychology Today. I think Psychology Today is in its uh, almost 60 years of, uh, of uh, service now. And um, uh, in those magazines that year, there were three articles by a man named Sam Keen, K-E-E-N. And the title was Sing the Body Electric. And it was about his experience at the hands of Dr. Rolf at Esalen Institute. And as I would read those articles, the letters literally jumped off the page. They stood up about four inches off the page and um, they, didn't, they wouldn't go back. There was, a, there was a dimension to what he was saying that wasn't in any other article in those magazines. Um, and um, I couldn't tell you one other article that uh, was in those magazines today, but... Um, uh, Sing the Body Electric struck me deeply. And so three years later, uh, actually the fall of 1966, um, I, was, um, 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 I was a passenger in an, uh, in an automobile uh, that uh, the driver um, was uh, driving too fast and uh, he flipped the car. Um, he missed, uh, missed a corner, flipped the car and it landed on the roof. There were no seat belts. And uh, so I landed head down in the footwell and he landed on top of me. And um, I had a closed head injury that was undiagnosed. And, um, uh, and then I started after that um, um, 
self-medicating pretty heavily, I think would be the term, uh, mostly hallucinogens. And, um, and so uh, in 1970, a couple of things happened. Uh, one is that uh, um, uh, the Vietnam War expanded and um, we had the national student strike. And, uh, and in that time frame, I got a high lottery draft number. And because of that, I dropped out of college with one semester to go. Um, and then in, um, also in 1970, Emmett and Peter uh, moved to Boulder and started the Guild for Structural Integration, later to become the Rolf Institute. And I knew a couple of people who were getting uh, 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 Rolfed at that time. But by that time, I was living down in the southern part of the state, about 60 miles north of uh, the New Mexico border. And so I... Uh, um, I heard about um, the wonderful experiences that my friends and family were having, um, um, and uh, I, 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 that word "rolfing" just kept sticking in my mind. It was prescient. And then in 1973, a friend of mine came up from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and she was interesting because she'd been hit by a, a bus in London and um, had been busted up pretty badly. And she said, "I know you're hurting." Um, at that time, I worked on the railroad. Uh, I did uh, um, loading dock work and I did section labor, meaning that I worked on a, a section gang repairing railroad tracks. So it's a hard life. It's a very hard life. Um, everything with the railroad is, is large and unforgiving. And um, uh, in those days, um, uh, I, like my compatriots on the railroad, um, um, was in uh, such pain that we'd get off work at 4.30 and at 4.31 I was standing at the bar starting to drink beers and we, we would drink it by the pitcher and um, the part of it was that my body was hurting so badly uh, I didn't know how badly my body was hurting so I, I traveled down to Santa Fe a distance of 150 miles to get my first session from Don Johnson Don wrote the first book that was published about rolfing. It was called The Protean Body. And, um, and so um, as he started to do the first session on me, within 10 minutes, it was very familiar. Um, I started seeing colors. I feel like I felt like then that I was uh, seeing my aura from the inside out. And um, within 10 minutes, everything started to be familiar to me. I knew what was coming next. And it was like I had done this before. And so uh, uh, we would get together once every three weeks. And, uh, and uh, as the process went on, by the end of the, oh, <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the effects of that hard labor for me was that, um, uh, and, and the auto accident, is that I could not turn my head right or left. Uh, I'd get shooters down my arms. And um, sleeping at night, my arms would go to sleep up to, up to the shoulders and would, they would be like this and they would wake me up and then I would un un uncurl myself and go back to sleep. But that, that, would, uh, that would wake me up three to five times per night. So I was, um, I was pretty stuck. By the third session, I started having a full range of mobility in my neck and I started having the opportunity to actually start feeling what was happening in my neck. And then um, uh, each session got progressively, as the series does, more more extraordinary. And uh, and uh, by the sixth session, um, I, I had a pretty acute lordosis um, at that point. By the sixth session, um, uh, we we did the session, and um, I was standing in a store later that day, standing in line. And um, um, I was, you know, just purchasing something in a convenience store, and my pelvis went from an a pretty acute anterior tip to shunk, and it fell into place. And all of a sudden, I was coursing with energy, and I uh, I started laughing, and then uh, my laughter was uncontrollable. So I had to go to the back of the store to to quit laughing because the experience was so extraordinary, and. Um, so, um, you know, some of the employees would come back and, uh, and, and, and look at me as I was doubled over laughing. And I finally got to where I could actually go and pay for, for what I was picking up. So every session in this series was, was, uh, was extraordinary for me. Um, and, um, and then the seventh session, um, 
Um, I thought that uh, Don had blown my head off, but um, uh, I all of a sudden, you know, had extraordinary length and decompression from all of the injuries. Uh, I wrestled up into college as well, so I had a really good history of, uh, um, of, of damaging my body. So uh, uh, at that time, I went to visit my parents uh, at one point, and I had always been about the same height as my father, but after the seventh hour, I was about an inch uh, taller than he was, which changed my worldview. It was like, wow, I'm bigger than dad. Amazing. So, um, uh, and the decompression of my body um, opened up a whole new vista, if you will. Everything about my relationship in the world started to change. And I like to use the word reconstitute. It's, it, it happens with our clientele, it happens with us. But a lot of times after a session, um, people reconstitute into their old pattern. And um, with, with the reconstituting in the old pattern, we collapse into what is more familiar. But to be in that extensional model and start to grow out of uh, the collapse that my body was in uh, was an extraordinary experience for me. And it opened a door that um, has not closed yet. Because of the familiarity of the work, I really wanted to become a practitioner. But in those days, it seemed like it was a very exclusive uh, fraternity of, of, of practitioners. And so I didn't say anything to Don about that. Um, in 1973 um, uh, was, um, uh, was my last session. It was on November 1st, 1973. And at the end of that, the close of that session, Don said, I want you to think about becoming a practitioner. I think you'd be a good one, and uh, and I will sponsor you because in those days you needed a sponsor to get in for an interview. So uh, I said, "Gee, thanks," and uh, I put on my backpack and I started hitchhiking for South America uh, from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, uh, there was a celestial event that I felt compelled to go to, and that was the comet Kahutek. Kahutek was a Czechoslovakian astronomer who discovered the first comet to enter the solar system before it got to the solar system. And lo, wondrously, uh, comet Kahutek was going to go behind the sun on the winter solstice. And so um, it was, uh, uh, and, and there was gonna be a solar eclipse. So uh, simultaneously, so it was like, I gotta go for that, which I did do. And, um, and uh, it was a great journey. And in a very real sense, it was the hero's journey. I had uncertainty about how much I wanted to change my life in order to do this work. And uh, as the fates conspired, camped out on a uh, Colombian hillside the night before the eclipse. By the way, nobody in their right mind camps out on a hillside in Colombia before anything, uh, especially not Anglos. And uh, that evening, um, uh, I had a rude awakening, which was that um, I was with uh, two other guys and uh, um, we, 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 we were subject to an armed robbery. Uh, and we encountered members of uh, the Shining Path, which was Che Guevara's guerrilla army in South America. And um, uh, we spent um, a short eternity with guns and the pistols in the back of our head and um, not knowing that we were going to survive. And so, um, uh, in fact, we were so clear that we weren't going to that um, I looked at my hand for the last time. I took my last drink of water and, uh, you know, expressed to my friends that, gee whiz, this is it. And, um, and then we, we decided to go, go out on the highest frequency we could. So we started oming. And I started praying my ass off. And um, um, just, I told Creator, if you get me out of this, I dedicate my life to service to humanity from here on out. Well, son of a gun, we got out of it. And so the Rolf work is the perfect medium of service, both to Creator and creation and humanity that I could possibly encounter. So I had to change my life and uh, I had to go back to college and get a degree. In those days, yeah, yeah, it's a crazy story. Uh, in those days, um, uh, the, the Rolf Institute did not have um, a program for taking care of uh, um, 
um, all the prerequisites. So you had to get those from outside. So it took me three years just to uh, handle all of the prerequisites um, so that I could get um, in for an, uh, an interview. And um, also in those days, you had to have uh, you had to have a letter of recommendation from your rolfer, your advanced rolfer, and uh, your structural patterner. Structural patterning was the work that Judith Aston developed, and um, everybody did you know a minimum of six sessions of patterning. So once all of those things were uh, accomplished, um, I I, um, I uh, had to write a candidate selection paper, which I did. It was fifty two pages, and then I got I got in for an interview in um, the, uh, it was November of 1975. And um, the only person I knew in, a, in, in this circle of people uh, was uh, Lewis Schultz, who wrote the book, uh, The Endless Web. He had been my patterner. And, um, and uh, he was sitting at the back of the room, facing away from me, smoking a cigarette. He used to smoke a lot, smoking a cigarette, but he would not look at me. And, um, and uh, the guy prior to me in the interview uh, was in there for about 45 minutes, and when he left, he, he was sobbing and he just went out the front door. And so it was like, oh my gosh, well, the fates conspired and, and uh, Jen Sultan was generous enough to say, I'll train the guy. So that was the beginning of that. And I audited uh, with um, Emmett in 1976, spring of 76. In those days, there were only two classes per year. There were so few people who really wanted to do this work. So, so um, 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 and I was in the largest class that had ever happened where there were 16 practitioners and there were eight um, um, uh, structural patterners who were also uh, doing that part of the course and um, part of their training. And, um, and then Emmett and uh, the late Jason Kane, who uh, was the assistant. And so um, I went through that. And then um, uh, in, in August that year, I went to uh, San Francisco for the Rolf Institute annual meeting, which was at a place called the Garden of Allah, which is outside of um, San Francisco. And so um, I was, uh, you know, kind of the new kid there. And um, I saw Dr. Rolf in the distance every now and then. And, you know, there was maybe 100 people there. So I was walking by one time and Dr. Rolf pointed her crooked index finger at me and she said, young man, come here, sit down, which I did. And uh, it was like a standing or sitting in this case in a beacon of light. And um, she talked to me for, you know, it was a short eternity uh, and uh, just asked me who I was and, you know, where I was in the training and one thing and another. And she said, I want you in my next class, which was starting in about a month. So I, um, uh, as, as the fates conspired, I did not get in that class because everyone had already paid their tuition, gotten their plane tickets and made all of those other arrangements. But I, but I did have the privilege of going and sitting in on some of those classes. And I have to laugh because uh, this came up for me this morning, which is that um, Peter Melchior was doing the uh, demo. And um, as he was doing the demo, it's the first hour, right? What can go wrong in the first hour? And uh, she'd been uh, working for about, I don't know, a good 30 seconds. And she goes, stop, you're doing it all wrong. So, so Peter goes, okay, okay. And he settles into uh, the body at hand and the moment at hand. And, uh, and um, he, uh, he uh, went ahead and did the demo. And, uh, and uh, I was uh, working to make money for, uh, my, uh, for, for my training. So I had to leave and, and get out the door. So I didn't get to talk to Dr. Rolf or any of my compatriots very much. That was, a, that was an advanced and basic class, which they used to do in those days. So I framed in um, San Francisco with Michael Salveson and Neil Powers um, in um, January of 1977, finished uh, March 18th of 1977. And then I had been uh, in the field, actually in those days, Colorado was a closed state. There, was, there weren't going to be any more practitioners allowed in Colorado. I was born here, so I said, I'm going. So um, anyway, I, uh, Dick Stensedvold, Richard Stensedvold, who was the um, executive director of the Institute, called me in one morning that spring. And uh, he was smiling strangely at me. And, uh, and um, I said, what have I done? And he goes, it's not what you have done, it's what you will do. Uh, which I learned over the years was uh, 
usually I, I, I was going to have to pay for something. Well, he says, we want you to do uh, the American Massage and Therapeutic Association uh, National Convention is in Denver this year, and we want you to do the, uh, the demo lecture. I said, well, why me? I mean, you've got Emmett, you've got Peter, you've got Jim Asher, you, all these guys are around. Why, why me? He goes, well, you're the new guy and nobody else wants to do it. Okay, I'll do it. Oh, and one more thing. Um, Dr. Rolf doesn't want you to do the demo part. You only get to do the lecture. <laughs> okay. So, um, so anyhow, um, uh, Norma Bell, Norma Bell Bandy and I wound up doing it. We were office partners and that was August of that year. And um, we were roundly booed for not doing the demo, but there, because there was about 700 people there, but it was, you know, it was down on the floor and, and, um, and um, uh, nobody, uh, everybody was going to stand up front. So I knew that not many people were going to see. And as the fates conspired, um, only two people came to the demo that we did, chose to do that night. And um, one was the, now my wife of 43 years. And, um, uh, and the other one was um, a nice gentleman who, uh, was kind enough to bring her there. Anyway, uh, that launched me into doing this beautiful work, and and um, and uh, from there I had the uh, uh, privilege. I worked for I did six classes with uh, Judith Aston, and um, and then I you know did the advanced training in '85, and um, and uh, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Rolf about three times, four times, and uh, she never knew my name, but we uh, we got along famously. And um, she always wanted me to have more tea and cookies. Anyway, then in 1990 is when I got into the teaching of this beautiful work. So uh, uh, that's my story. That's how I got to this point. And um, um, I want to remind everybody that, that this body of work is a way of life to find one's line. It's an opportunity and it's a window to center and, and uh, uh, find center and move in the world, move through this life in a centered way. Um, my wife is a Blackfeet, she's Native American, she's a Blackfeet and uh, uh, in their way of living, they, uh, they, they, they try to walk in balance, harmony, beauty and peace, which I have found is a great um, um, exercise. And so um, uh, that has been my um, uh, part of my walk through this journey of life. And so, uh, uh, and then with respect to that, there's the opportunity, the window to do this, gr this glorious work on a, on a daily basis. Um, I do about um, 112 sessions a month, have for years. If I was a horse, I'd be a mule. Um, and uh, uh, um, it's just that I'm, you know, built for doing this work and, um, and I've had the opportunity to work with uh, a lot of people. So um, that has been great grace. And um, uh, Dr. Rolf used to say, nobody gets rich doing this work, but it's a rich life. And there's no question about that. It feeds us on so many levels and layers and it forces us to continually grow to move through our patterns, unconscious patterns, start to come into conscious awareness. And we, as we start to move through our patterns in a more, uh, in a more conscious way. And so um, um, doing that brings us to, you know, embodying consciousness even. And uh, that's, um, that's the heart of the work for me. And that's part of the transmission I try to convey whenever I do a session. Dr. Rolf used to say that um, uh, this work is about the whole person. It's about the being as well as the body. And uh, she said, you know, I'm interested in the whole person. The body's the only thing I can get my hands on. So um, uh, here we are. We get our hands on, uh, on uh, people's bodies. and. Um, uh, there is there is the tendency to think that it's all about structure, but it's how how do we take this plastic structure and um, uh, um, help it to organize itself in the field of gravity? It's always a question of imposing structure or evoking structure, and I'm a I'm a structural evoker.
And so, um, uh, because everybody, uh, if they, Peter used to say, if they walk in the door, they got something right going on. How can you make that better? So, affecting the structure and therefore the function of how the body works uh, opens all windows and all doors. And, um, and um, it allows people to um, look at their own life and go through tra personal transformation. We, we usually don't know what the transformation is that we're transmitting. Some people talk about it, many do not. I have some people who come in and they tell me, gee, how the, how the ride to my office was and, uh, and what happened with the kids at breakfast this morning and stuff like that. But I know that even if somebody's talking like that, they're actually processing something very deep within. And so uh, um, I try not to guide it too heavily, uh, knowing that it, um, uh, the work is going where it needs to go. Well, there's some initial thoughts. So um, if anybody has any uh, thoughts, questions, insights, um, I'm open to. Okay, well, while we are, we are waiting for questions from the audience, uh, I can ask you something about, um, about uh, um, what, what is it like for you to teach versus to, um, to have, uh, to, to, versus the private practice? Ah, well, you know, Dr. Rolf always felt, thought and felt that she wanted um, uh, all of her teachers to have a private practice. And um, uh, it's still <laughs> that way, I think, that uh, anybody who teaches should have a private practice. And uh, I find that teaching, I learn so much more. Teaching is only learning at a, at a higher level. And every class feeds me in ways that previous ones did not. It opens uh, whole new windows and vistas. And when I, when, I, when I learn from the teaching, the process of teaching, then I also, uh, when I go back into private practice, my practice is different. I have a different focus and intention uh, in, in what I'm doing. And over the years, I have found that to be true. In fact, you, you may find this in your practice, that as, as you go about your work, every once in a while, you'll get an insight. You know, I'm, I'm allowed a couple insights a week, but um, uh, uh, as, as, as I get an insight, then uh, it's like, wow, that's interesting. What would happen if I did this in this situation? And I've learned to trust that voice. The, that that insight and, uh, and and as I do that something a little different from uh, normal normal work whatever the hell that is uh, it, ha it happens um, I have a brief anecdote Peter and I were teaching a class one time and I got to the third session and my my model uh, had extremely flat feet so we we're going to do a line session right and uh, uh, but this guy's feet were real flat. And so I went to Peter in the morning. I said, you know, I have this idea that um, uh, I would like to start at the feet and work up today. Never done that before. And he goes, wow, well, okay. We know what happens if you do it the other way. So I said, okay. So I started working on the lateral arches of this guy and worked his worked him up one side and then worked him up the other side. And, and um, after I'd done e e the two sides relatively evenly, I had him stand up and he, he, was, he, he was standing completely differently. He had a sense of line. His feet were balanced. They were under him. He didn't have a wide stance or anything. And as he, uh, so then I was going to do some uh, neck work and a pelvic lift. And as and I watched him lay down and was like, oh, that was smooth. And Peter, in his infinite insight, said, there, did you see that? I was like, oh, what? <laughs> and he goes, every joint in his body let go at the same moment. I was like, oh, I didn't even have a clue that that could happen. So 
uh, every class has its insights and um, I, I always see new things because there's always something new to see. So the, the very process of teaching is, is the, the deeper process of learning. David, there is a question from Alex is asking, would you be able to say what you learn from which SI teacher? Um, well, that's a long story. And um, um, in brief, um, I learned about the line from Emmett. Emmett was the prophet of the line. And um, uh, I don't think anyone um, actually talked about the line as much as Emmett did. Um, and Emmett was my primary teacher for 13 years. And um, 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 I really loved and respected him. I traded work with him for 10 years. And um, so I learned a lot that way as well. Peter was the master of space. Um, Peter used to work on space more than the line. So he was always working on how do we organize the space and the line starts to, to be evoked within that space. So the two of them had a really different um, uh, approach. And, you know, Fulvio is going to be talking about Peter's touch and someone else I think is talking about Emmetson. And um, those, are, uh, those are two totally different paradigms in how to accomplish this wondrous work. However, uh, they're both extraordinarily effective. And, um, uh, and Peter always used to say to me, I love the way you work space. And I go, I love the way I work space. And um, so um, I'm always dancing between the intimate relationship between space and line, line and space, and how it all fits into the gravitational field, and how it all is supported from the earth up. Because one of the gifts of this work is grounding, that we finally get our feet on the ground. We start to relate to the ground, and that gives us a lift that, um, that um, carries us forward. Um, maybe there, there's another question is, uh, okay, what is the latest thing you're hot on uh, in this private, in the private practice, practice? And this is, sorry, my, I need to get close. Nick Pavoldi is, uh, is asking for this. What is the latest thing uh, that I'm in, in private practice? That, yeah, that you're hot. I mean, the, the, the coolest thing you're, you're, you say you have two insights a week, which is yeah. kind of amazing for me. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to have one uh, in here that would be enough. But. Well, you know, uh, for me to, for that to happen, uh, I actually have to get out of the way. Uh, who I think I am has to get out of the way. Um, I have a picture of Dr. Rolf on my wall and every once in a while, I feel like she comes through the picture and gives me direction. And, um, 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 you know, I've been out of, week, out of work for two weeks and I've got another four weeks to go in terms of this, this closing down of the, mm -hmm. the system. So it's really interesting to not be going in on a regular basis and doing work. Now, you know, it's just the internal work, which uh, for me, has to do with embodiment of consciousness, which, uh, in, you know, for me, that really is the elemental root of this work, which is that we're transmitting something. We tend to talk about structure all the time, but mm -hmm. in, in the gestalt of talking about structure and function, what falls into the background is the energy uh, that is the structure and that is the function. And um, um, I, I, I taught uh, embryology to the uh, lead-in classes um, on a regular basis. And um, Dr. Rolf called fascia the organ of form. So the insight that's most interesting to me is how do we go from formless consciousness 
-hmm. into a fascial matrix of three di three dimensionality that phenomena and so therefore uh, with respect to that who's doing the work where does the energy come from within what is that energy to 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 introduce into someone else's system peter used to say that uh what you know he said he, peter would say we're in a process we're, we're we're doing a process but what's the process that we're doing and um rolfing no <laughs> uh he would always say life the process that we're involved in is life so we're always entering into people's life stream for a, a, a usually limited period of time and then um as soon as they get full enough or whatever of of of, of the energy or the changes then it's time for them to move on and 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 learn to support those changes in their own body in their own life and in their own walk of life i used to have a woman that i worked with for 30 35 years and uh, she had a pretty bad scoliosis and um, she was a hairdresser so she was on her feet all of the time and um, she would uh, call me up and she'd go you gotta stop the changes i can't i can't keep changing stop it please stop it so i bring her in and I do a grounding session and send her out the door. And um, six months later, she call me back and she go, please, please, I, I need to change. I got to change. I can't keep going on like this. I'm, I'm so stuck. So uh, yeah, you know, and that was her cycle and rhythm. We'd work for six months, we'd take six months off. We'd work for six months, take six months off. So uh, we're always introducing conscious awareness into our own system, as well as the bodies at hand and the people at hand. And part of what we're doing is we're trying to bring Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know, we, we tend to get so fragmented as, as, as beings and people that part of this work is to bring people back into harmony with themselves, ourselves. So. Peter used to say that a first hour is actually opening up that which separates me from out there that the superficial fascial layer is what I, what I use to separate myself from the rest of the world. Who used to say this? Sorry, I missed that. Peter, Peter Melchior. Peter. Okay. Yeah. David, I get, uh, thank you for all that you're saying is um, very inspiring for me. And I think for most of the people that are here, so someone is saying, uh, uh, Elena was asking, uh, you to talk more about the relationship with line and consciousness in your experience but then she said that i think she is already answering to the the question with the things you already said i don't know if you want to add something let me let me pass you other questions and then you will choose um there is a uh, I, I just want to say that um i hope this presentation generates questions within each of you because then you have to, you know, in terms of insights and other things, then you have to settle into, okay, well, well gee, what is that? Uh, you know, what is it that I'm cogitating? What is it that uh, got triggered there? How does that, uh, how does that affect me? And therefore the work, because the work never ends internally. No. Yeah. So John Karu is asking, one of the most important thing I learned from David is to be the center of the cyclone. <laughs> and he's, uh, he said, thank you for doing what you've done in the past and now in this exceptional time we're in. That's all. So, um, I would just like to say one thing about John, which is that uh, he, got, he got polio at a very early age and um, he spent many years in an iron lung and um, his legs do not work. He, he, he might be in a wheelchair now, but um, he uh, historically was in crutches. And he used to come to classes, uh, he and his wife, um, Lori, then light wife Lori, uh, used, and Lori's a practitioner. She's San Antonio, I believe. And um, so uh, John would be one of my models. And, um, and uh, we just used to have a great time doing th uh, you know, a, a three session series because he'd had a number of surgeries to allow him to be able to sit up. So he was a massive scar tissue. 
So, John, if you want to talk, you have to unmute your microphone. Um, and then there Hi. is. Uh, hello. Hi, this is Lori. It sounds like it's actually John's, but it's me. Hi, David. Thank you so much for what you're doing, and thanks yes, for sharing, Lori. Is that Lori? Is there something else you want to add or ask while you're here? No, she muted herself. Okay, <laughs> go on. Um, then there was another question. Uh, there are other questions. One is, uh, um, sorry, Sean Arons, can you please say something about your experience with Stacy Mills? Stacy Mills. Um, um, Stacy was the grand dame of rolfing. Um, Stacy apprenticed with Dr. Rolf starting back in the 1950s. She and Dorothy Nolte, um, who did um, structural awareness, which was the initial movement work in this body of work, um, um, were, were friends until um, Dorothy walked away with Stacy's husband. Anyway, um, uh, Stacy was this wonderful. Uh, Stacy was about six two, six three. She was a large woman, but. Uh, and she did, she did the work for many, many years. And a lot of people wanted her to start teaching the work before um, she, uh, um, uh, well, in the 1970s. And she said, not until Dr. Rolf dies, I'm not doing that. And so after 1979, Stacy started teaching and she's taught for the Institute until 1989, uh, 1990 really. And then she taught also the second class for the uh, Guild um, uh, in the fall of 1990. And um, uh, she and Peter and I did a couple of classes together. And um, um, Stacy had had a stroke. And um, so um, she was, um, you know, she wasn't, she was not well, and uh, she was declining in her years. She was in her early mid seventies. And um, so um, when it got to where she couldn't actually, uh, you know, maintain. Oh, your microphone. Ta -da. Okay. I don't know how I did that, but you know, I don't know how to do a lot of things like structural integration. Um, uh, so Stacy, um, um, after we did a couple of classes together, we became very close. And so I used to go over to her house uh, once a month and I would give her a session and uh, we'd sit and have tea and then and just talk about the work. And um, she had her own magical way of getting everything done. And uh, she was very insightful because she hadn't trained in a regular basic training like everybody else. In the old, old days, Dr. Rolf would call people like her up and say, I'm doing a class, be there. And it would be like a week long class, a six day or something like that. So uh, Stacy was um, uh, a wonderful representative of uh, the work for many, many years and uh, a gracious and wonderful woman. Hell of a practitioner. There's another. Uh, there's a question on. Uh, I don't know if it, if it's the right moment to ask you this, but it's some advice on working with clients with kyphosis. Uh, um, you want to say something right now about that? Yeah. Well, um, uh, one of my specialties and continual insights is working with people with scoliosis. And that's because my wife has scoliosis due to her left leg being shorter than her right. She was hit by a truck while she was riding a bicycle when she was 12 and her left leg did not grow the same as her uh, right. Um, um, and so she has an uneven base of support and uh, that is pretty much unchangeable. So, um, uh, the lateral deviation of the spine um, is, is a very interesting thing to work with. So with kyphosis, when you have deep, uh, for every kyphosis, I think of there's a, there's a lordosis. Uh, one of the things you have to find out about ky kyphotic uh, bodies is whether or not they have an extra vertebra. Some people have an extra thoracic vertebra. Um, um, I used to have a friend who had that, so it, it, it's in my mind. Um, and uh, if they have an extra, uh, extra vertebra, then you also have to find out if it's 
a hemivertebra or or a, a not fully formed vertebra and if that's part of what's not supporting the torso. But what is it with kyphosis or scoliosis, what is it that is not allowing the spine to distribute weight through the system in the field of gravity? Invariably with kyphosis, uh, there's an anterior, <laughs> uh, there's an anterior tilt uh, to, the, to the pelvis and the lumbars. So as is really short. So um, uh, getting length into that, that and getting the pelvis enhancement of the base of support is you know, a key to getting um, the system to stand on its own in, in a more comfortable way. Okay, David, I think we're going to wrap up in a bit. There was, um, maybe you want to say something on, uh, on this. I was struck by when you said that energy is what put together um, structure and, and fun. there are two aspects of energy are the structure and function. Um, I want to, the last question probably is this one from Alan Richardson. He's asking, what is the main reason you love this work? Is, uh, I mean, you, you said many. <laughs> you want to focus on one only? <laughs> or? Uh, you know, I think, uh, um, I think the best thing to say is in this moment, as Alan asks this question, uh, what comes to mind is uh, that one has to be centered and balanced. The work of being centered and balanced while working while working, uh, walking uh, in this world um, is, uh, is an ongoing process. And, uh, you know, Emmett used to say, as soon as you find your line, you're starting to fall, fall out of it. Um, and so um, it's an ongoing project to be able to uh, uh, be centered and be present. And to the degree that we can do that, that really it touches people in a different way. It allows people to, uh, uh, touch themselves from the center. We, we say that uh, we can't um, work on anybody, we can't work on anything in somebody else that we haven't already healed in ourselves, right? If you have a deep emotional trauma that you're, you know, walking around with, someone on the table intuitively will know that. And they, they, if, if, if they have a similar energetic holding pattern uh, and or structural holding pattern, then they're unlikely to open that up to you and to themselves. So the, 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 the continual process of um, clearing and healing is uh, what turns my crank. Um, do you wanna, one last question? Because there's a Christy Bender, she's asking for someone. And then Alan's saying, thank you. I love you, thank you, okay. Um, so there's a question from Christy. She's asking, David, so grateful to be able to work with you. I'm hearing the power of mentorship in Teach As I Work. I am wondering how you see the work evolving through mentorship and hacks. This is the last one, guys. That's a neat question because um, that's the classic model of a guild. That's, that's what Dr. Rolf's idea of a guild was, is that, uh, you know, this work gets passed down from one person to another. Um, um, as one person, shall we say, ascends in their experience, years and years of practice, and hypothetically gets into a position to be able to teach this work, um, that um, uh, the learning curve doesn't abate. In fact, uh, back to Alan, you know, one of the things I love about this work is that the learning curve is like this that has not changed it's still uh, the the learning curve is is just huge uh and so um um it, it has not abated for me so um i forget what i was saying before that it's hard to tell you <laughs> too many words <laughs> Uh, you want to try to recover, guys? Can you help us? <laughs> so I think uh, 
Okay, this is right. Like so, yeah, um, so, um, so, um, with respect to mentoring, um, uh, for those of us who have more years of experience, it's invaluable for us to pass on um, whatever it is that we know, what we think we know, uh, to someone who is ready to learn whatever we have to say at a given time. And um, uh, the beauty of this work is that we're all involved in the same river, so to speak. There is a flow to this particular body of work that in my experience, and of course, I don't have experience with anything else now for many years, but the, the flow of this work is, is, uh, is a river that moves itself. And um, it takes, takes one along a course that, um, that uh, uh, one does not know where one will wind up. Dr. Rolf used to say, by doing this work, it changes your karma. There's an interesting thought. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so here we are. Um, Clearing karma, if you will, um, unless we are, we're not, uh, but uh, clearing karma uh, so that, um, uh, you know, it, it relaxes and releases things in other people's bodies. Okay, so, so how, to, how to work with other people, um, uh, uh, student practitioners, and to me, it's just like with what Peter used to say, if they can walk in the room, you know, they have enough together that we can build on that. So I find that mentoring, uh, and I'm starting to have a lot of fun with mentoring, um, mentoring right now uh, uh, about three Rolf Institute uh, people, and um, uh, we are having a good time, and I'm learning a lot. So it's, it's uh, teaching once again, but in a smaller context, smaller in that it's just a number of, you know, it's just a few of us, but um, it's a very expansive relationship and, uh, and um, it shows no sign of uh, abating. You know, I'll continue to work with these people for a long time because we make beautiful relationships with people. There is a comment. Uh, I, would, I would like to read uh, a comment to you, David, that um, Mary Bond wrote just uh, a few minutes ago. And so I love this question about mentorship. Passing it down from person to person and not it's to tell shall I this is it. Sorry, my pronunciation, but um so I'm I'm glad we are we have all these friends also connected in this uh, in this chat. So I think it's time to wrap up, even if I, I would go on for uh, another hour. Maybe we can do another session with all you good with time. after. And uh, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, send us uh, questions, uh, requests. We, we will try to put in line for, for the next thing. So and th this is something we're organizing for, uh, for the community. It's, uh, it's, it's coming from uh, European Guild, but this is for, for, for all of us, all of the structure integration. So. Um, let, let's stay here and contribute to this uh, uh, in, in this moment. Next meeting is going to be with Mer Bert Smith. Uh, Bert, uh, I don't see you in, in the list, so I cannot give you the, uh, the speaker. I've tried, but um, it would be about the, the, title, the title is uh, Healing the Crack in the Cosmic Egg. And um, it's about a conversation and meditation on the integration of body, mind and spirit. That's uh, the line of uh, the speech. So we will see you next Tuesday at same time, same channel. And thank you for being here. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would just like to say um, to everybody, take care of yourselves. Be well. Take care of your loved ones. And um, we'll get through this. And when 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 not, when the dust settles we will uh we'll be in more demand than we were before because i i re truly believe that people are going to be needy partly from being in isolation for so long and um uh, you know not touching themselves or each other as much as uh they might otherwise and um so um the door will open and we'll be in demand and uh you all deserve to uh 
touch those people. They're they're looking for you. Thank you, David. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. Ciao, brother. Thank you. Ciao, David. Ciao.